So I'm back today with Veronica Grant for part two of our conversation. Last week, we chatted a bit about self-care and relationships and saboteurs and so many wonderful things relating to her work as a dating coach. And today, Veronica's back and we are, we have a lot of things in store, right? Yeah. We do, yeah. Totally pumped. So welcome back. Um, Thanks. Yeah. So much fun to be here. Yeah. Awesome. Always good to have you. Um, this whole this whole interviewing, podcasting, video creating thing I'm finding is just so much fun. So yes, uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be more to come. So today, Veronica, there's a, you know, a few topics that I want to dive into with you. And the first one is around this concept of perfectionism. So, you know, in my community, I work with a lot of women who have kind of a perfectionistic, maybe type A I call it the all or none mentality towards food and eating sometimes where they're maybe in this dieting space and, and trying to perfect their eating. And then with one little slip up, they fall off the wagon. And what I found in further discussions with these people is that not only does that apply to food and eating, but it can kind of impact other areas of life. Like how you do one thing is sometimes how you do everything. And so in your work as a dating mindset coach, like, how do you find, do you, A, I guess, do you think that um, perfectionism is sometimes an issue for some of your clients when it comes to approaching relationships? And then how do you deal with that? Yeah, so it shows up in a lot of ways. Um, the first way is just perfectionist that's more self-imposed. Um, like I have to be a certain size or I have to look a certain way or I have to act a certain way. I can't mess up any text or anything like that. Um, and you know, you're pretty much putting yourself up to a, an impossible standard because mm -hmm. perfection doesn't really exist anywhere in the world. Um, and the <laughs> other way that my clients do it is they, especially when they have, when they're operating off of a perfect hand list, which uh, that's the first thing that we do is we have a whole ceremony, we burn it, no, we don't have a ceremony, but we do get rid of the perfect man list. But what happens is that becomes like your ideal, your idea of a perfect man. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start judging everyone against that perfect man list. And the thing is that you're judging someone again from an impossible standard. So mm -hmm. it just doesn't really work because, and you're just setting yourself up for failure and not just for failure, but just for a lot of frustration. And this is when dating can start to feel um, really draining and um, just like everything you're doing is just like uh, with to no end completely worthless. And that's really just because you're holding yourself up to these standards that just don't exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, I, I think it was in one of your podcast episodes, um, there was a piece about, well, I don't know if it related directly to per perfectionism, but like this kind of perfect man list and, you, you know, how you're, you're showing up in this relationship being kind of super judgy because there's mm -hmm. expectations that you want met. And mm -hmm. one thing that I think I heard you say with one of your guests was something about bringing value or shifting your mindset to bringing value to the conversation is that something that you, you know, talk a lot about with your, your people around how to kind of shift from the perfectionist mindset to like being in a better space for dating or how does that affect the relationship? Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, this kind of leads into the other thing you wanted to talk about, which is people pleasing, but instead of, you know, people pleasing and being perfect is all about how others are thinking of you and mm -hmm. how they perceive you. And I mean, just a little bit of tough love, like people aren't thinking about you as much as you think they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And hopefully it should actually make you feel a little bit better. Like, oh yeah, maybe they didn't notice like the little, you know, sesame seed that I had stuck in my tooth. I mean, maybe they did, <laughs> I don't know. But, <laughs> but people aren't like, if they did notice it, they're not thinking about it like three hours later, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, but, you know, the whole perfectionist thing and people pleasing, it's all about putting the intention, attention back on uh, back on you. And I actually heard it described by, um, a, on a podcast recently about how it's the other end of narcissism or just like mm -hmm. another side of the coin. It doesn't mean that you're a narcissist if you're a perfectionist or if you are a people pleaser, but it's just this idea of like putting so much attention on yourself that, um, you know, you have to, you, you, you have to please people or you have to act in this perfect way. Um, and so, and I think it was actually the most recent podcast where the, the guy was talking about this. It was the podcast with the with the male dating coach, um, mm -hmm. and he was just saying, "Well, you know, shift the focus from on if you're going to keep the focus on you, 
then shift it around a little bit so that you're just focusing okay how can I add value to the conversation or to the mm -hmm. experience um, or whatever it is and that kind of brings you down from this oh my gosh I have to be perfect I have to be perfect do they have to like me they have to mm -hmm. um, you know whatever um, mm -hmm. you want them to think about you Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Do you yeah. think it's a long process for people? Like I, you know, I would consider myself a recovering perfectionist. In fact, I had um, a guest coming into my home today, and I'm I'm leaving tomorrow for a little vacation. So I didn't. I was I invited them for lunch, and then I was like, oh gosh, I don't have that much stuff, but I want to use up what I have, and I'm kind of like throwing stuff together and running around cleaning up the house. And, and I noticed my own kind of inner perfectionist is like, I want everyone to see that this is normal and I'm put together and all this stuff. And, you know, because I'm a dietitian, the food better be great. And, and I was like, oh my God, this is BS. And, you know, I guess the question is, does it seem to take people a long time to get to a space where they can set down the perfect man lists and, and shift out of shift out of being so focused on what other people think to being in this place of how do I add value? It depends. I, I find a lot of women shift pretty quickly out of the perfect man list because what I offer instead um, makes people really excited. Mm. Um, and so they really latch on to that. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes they might go down the perfect man list rabbit hole again. But I think <laughs> for the most part, um, you know, they get really excited about you know, what we do instead of the perfect man list. And um, you know, I think I think there's more so there, just more confusion. Like, um, you know, what is really something that's negotiable and what is really something that's non-negotiable? Because you're mm -hmm. allowed to have the non-negotiables. It's not like you just have to mm -hmm. get rid of your perfect man list and just make any old date work for you. I mean, right. Obviously you have some boundaries and negotiables and non-negotiables. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's more of just like an area of confusion of like what's okay to bend on and what's not okay to mm -hmm. bend on totally um, and then in terms of the perfectionist I mean perfectionism is just a form of addiction I think and once you're an addict you're always an addict so it's just about managing it oh I love um, that that makes and, perfect sense <laughs> yeah and so you know like I'm definitely a perfectionist too and I can just see like looking back at my own life just seeing it getting um transferred to other places you know first mm -hmm. it was on my grades and school, I, mean, I was super perfectionist, and then it um, went into my body, um, and like having to be a certain size, and then it went into my business, I had to have a perfect business, uh, where everything had to be perfect before I could like do anything in my business, um, mm -hmm. and then I definitely even projected my perfectionism um, on CV and our relationships sometimes too, so it's just a thing that always comes up, and that it's not about getting rid of it or curing it, it's just simply about managing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's so true. And I can see how that shows up for, for me in my own life and for other clients as well. Um, oh, it just started pouring rain here, which I I think you might be wishing for in that Texas heat. I made Veronica turn her air conditioner off because it was too loud. But now I have rain that's like pouring in. I don't know if you can hear. Can you hear it? The spring um, brings a lot of flooding in Texas. Okay. Like tornadoes and storms. So we just had a bunch of that. And now we're like not going to see rain until October. Okay. Can, is it distracting? Can you hear it quite a lot? Awesome. Maybe a little bit. Oh, maybe it's just nice background noise. I don't, I don't really want to close my window because I like that fresh air coming in. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> okay, where were we? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, we we're talking about perfectionism, of course. So yeah, I think in a lot of ways, it holds us back, right? In all areas. And you're right. I think it's just important to manage and... Uh, you know, keep moving forward. I start to try and live by the mantra progress, not perfection. And it's something I teach in, in my courses and programs. So I think, you know, just taking that next step forward and mm -hmm. working at self-improvement yeah, in that way. Like, like be scared you're going to mess up and then just do it anyway. And if you mess up, then whatever. Dan dance <laughs> along with fear, hey? And then realize nobody cares as much as you think. I think you said that in our last episode together. Um, and for anyone listening or watching, uh, who, if you haven't seen part one of the conversation with Veronica, that's just over at worthyandwell.com forward slash Veronica part one. Pretty straightforward. So, um, so let's dive into then people pleasing, which is kind of tied to perfectionism. Um, just like giving in to other people's desires instead of resonating with yeah. your own. How does people pleasing show up in the context of dating and relationships? 
So I actually think people pleasing is a root or core issue for probably the majority of my clients. Mm. Um, and what I find to be really interesting, I have not done like actual study, but most of my clients are teachers or nurses. Oh, or some sort of like helper, helper profession. Mm-hmm. And I think what a lot of in theory that I think a lot of them um, project that uh, wanting to always be of service and a helper mentality on their relationship. Mm. And um, yeah, of course, like there's a part of that in a relationship where you're helping someone or you're supporting someone, you're nurturing someone. But you know that, like everything, it exists in in balance. Um, so. I'm trying to think of where I want to go with this with a lot of guys, uh, but I think the first thing is that we just, a lot of the women that I work with just feel really guilty about putting themselves first or saying no to someone or doing something for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially if that you know, takes the place or gets prioritized over, you know, helping someone else or you know, saying yes to someone else before you say yes to yourself. Um, and the easiest way I just like try to help women just get through this mental hurdle is just to imagine like a water cooler at like a soccer match <laughs> and um where are you going with this veronica <laughs> i don't even know i don't even know like any type of thing that there's a water cooler and everyone's getting the water to rehydrate themselves but if the water is not being replenished then the cooler is not going to have any more water to get and so it's the same thing like i'm like okay if nothing else you just think of um, oh my god. Putting yourself first and doing your self care as just really a self reflect because if you can replenish yourself and then add to the well, add to the water to it, then you're going to be able to actually get some more. Totally. Um, and, be, and be more present and be more assertive when you are you know, with someone else, mm-hmm. whether it's in your career or in your own relationship. Mm hmm. Okay, I need to pause here. Things have gotten wild in the natural world. <laughs> We've got major hail. Do you even know what hail is? Do you get that down there? One. Okay. There. I closed the window. Um, it was just getting really loud. We've got a storm coming in right now. So, um, yes, no, this whole, like, filling yourself up, filling yourself up. I think it's something we hear all the time, you know, the the typical sort of airport example, like put your own oxygen mask on before you put someone else's on. Yeah. And I think it's really hard for women to implement. Um, but it's, it's... And I think it's because we're raised to be nurturers and to, you know, but, I, but in addition to a lot of my clients being teachers or nurses, almost all of them also had a mother that was... Um, overly nurturing and submissive to their father and so they just learned like that's what women do Mm -hmm. so I think it's something that's learned I think it's something that we're nurtured to be like Mm -hmm. Um, but it just creates really unhealthy dynamics in a relationship Um, do you have some examples of that like how could that be a sabotage for a relationship well like so one client that I recently worked with um, she was actually trying to leave a uh, relationship and he just kept making her feel like that she was wrong she was an abandoning abandoning him and she made a commitment because they were actually married um, mm-hmm. and um, that she had to you know hold true to that and um, uh, you know so basically like it wasn't necessarily like being overly nurturing but it was to the sense of where she just felt like she had to please him and that his feelings and his priorities were more important than whatever she knew to be true for her. And she had mm-hmm. a lot of guilt about leaving this relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, but when she was really you know, in tune with herself, she knew that it was the best thing for her and that the relationship wasn't going to give her what she needed. Mm-hmm. Um, but she had to fight through a bunch of guilt, a bunch of shame. And, um, and it was mostly, I mean, some of it was self-inflicted, but a lot of it was just her ex-husband um, making her feel like she, you know, was kind of less than a, less than a woman in Mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think another, uh, another group of people that struggle with this too, this, I guess, people pleasing or putting yourself last or moms or people with young, Mm -hmm. well, children of all ages, right? Do you work with any moms where you see this happening? Yeah, it's really hard, and it and it's hard because I don't have kids, so just right. Me, me neither. So I'm, I'm always, I'm always kind of like, um, I, I have no right to speak to this, but here's what I think might help. Yeah. So I don't have kids. However, 
However, I do think that there are a lot of things that moms can do to create more space for themselves. Once you're beyond that nesting stage or, you know, whenever um, the kids are a little bit older, I think there actually is a really beautiful thing about setting some boundaries and like, okay, this is like mom's hour. Like you guys have to go watch a TV show or play outside or do something and mm-hmm. you know, only come get me if there's blood or something like something uh, like that. Um, and, you know, actually the same client who, um, that I helped, you know, her leave her marriage, uh, her mother just did everything for everyone and never took care of herself. Mm-hmm. And, um, and now she's like really sick and she's just not very healthy, both physically or emotionally or mentally. Um, and she's like kind of having to unlearn like that women, you know, are just supposed to be mothers and wives and nothing more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's having to unlearn that and relearn a new way of being a woman now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's actually a really interesting way to look at it is if you're a mom, just, you know, setting some boundaries and saying like, no, this is mom's hour or, you know, no kids allowed in this corner of the house or whatever it is. Um, it, you might feel a little bad or feel guilty for it or like you're being a bad mom. But I actually think, especially if you have daughters, um, you're really actually teaching them, teaching them that it's okay. And they actually, like, it's a good idea to mm-hmm. put themselves first and to mm-hmm. take care of themselves and do what they need to do. Mentally mm-hmm. And emotionally. Mm-hmm. What an excellent segue. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> Veronica and I talked offline about our key topic points and boundaries is, uh, you know, the last one that I really would love to dive into with you because, you know, we were talking about how that really could be the solution to some of the, the people pleasing. So mm-hmm. how do women set up healthy boundaries to honor themselves? So, I mean, boundaries are different for every person. So mm-hmm. what might be a boundary for me is not a boundary for you or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So it's really just, um, it's, it's a lot of guess and check um, or kind of experimenting around with figuring out like what's okay for you or what what not's okay for you first just Mm -hmm. an example like a really easy example of a boundary is um you know Tuesday nights is the night that I go to my I'm just making this up to Zumba and like it just lights me up and I get like to move and I like get sweaty and I you know exercise and whatever it is um and if you're with somebody or with kids and then you start like you know Um, and imposing on those boundaries, like you can't make this one thing a week, you know, that's an example of a boundary. So that's like an easy example. Mm -hmm. Um, But for me, I think my boundaries really start with my self care, and really getting clear on what I need to take care of myself and all the parts of my life that are really important to me. So Mm -hmm. my health and my self care are really important to me. Obviously, my business is important to me, hanging out with my um, like non-romantic relationships, so friends and having a strong community, and then of course having time for myself and then having time for Stevie. So it's a lot of moving pieces, and so mm-hmm. it's all about just kind of putting them together, like literally, like it's a puzzle. This is actually mm-hmm. a process I do with my with my clients, um, and that really lays the very it's really the groundwork for your um, for some boundaries mm-hmm. because then you know if you're dating or if you're in a relationship and then you know when you want to do things on your own or do things with your partner or like, you're kind of like in this kind of this dance of like, how do we operate with, with each other and like Mm -hmm. merge each other's lives? Like you have like some pieces to play with, to, to put them together. Mm -hmm. And the thing about boundaries is they're, they're always changing. I mean, they change with the seasons of your life and even the seasons of your year or of the year, like, you know, summertime, you might do something a little bit different or Mm -hmm. like, you're in your 20s you might do something different than when you're 30s when you have kids when your kids are older so while your boundaries are super important and kind of like the blueprint to um dating and relationships they are also always changing and um changing again as you go through life cycles but also just changing because your priorities might change or mm-hmm. you might change um or what you thought was important to you isn't really important to you and then you know that stuff always switch switches up so right it's it's like honoring them but also knowing that they might change right so your inner perfectionist won't like that very much the, th- the fact that things change and that we need to be <laughs> flexible with them right <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, and you I mean, in some ways but then it's like I have like these boundaries and I'm just like no well, well like my my ideal self-care calendar you know and the way I work with that like I want to like stick to that as much as possible but also allowing myself to like you know not take Friday afternoons off 
you know, recently. I haven't done that in the past, like, two months, even though that's what my self-care calendar says I would do. Right, right. Just being okay with that. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. I can manage that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I love that you mentioned self-care calendar, too, because, you know, you were talking about your self-care and and really honoring that as a way of setting boundaries. And Mm -hmm. An actual calendar, it's, some, it's a tool that both you and I use, I know, uh, for ourselves to keep us on track. And, for, and we suggest it to many of our clients that you actually, if you want to prioritize something, schedule it in, write it down, put it yeah. on the calendar. And the idea isn't that you have everything kind of micro scheduled, but that there's at least blocks of time set out to help you with those boundaries. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and on top of your self-care calendar, like actually putting in time to exercise or meditate or journal because um, I don't know who says this, but if it's not in your calendar, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Um, So I like put everything in my calendar and um, you know, I'm using technology for all the good things that it can do for us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And it's, it's just so helpful for me to it. And actually what it actually does help me do is normally when I would feel guilty about doing nothing or Mm -hmm. sleeping in or reading a book for fun or watching Netflix, what actually helps me to feel less guilty about that is knowing that I've pieced everything together in my life so that I know I can fit it all in. I can still get all my priorities done Mm -hmm. so that I can actually sit and watch Netflix all day Sunday and not feel guilty about it because I know that I'm still going to get everything else done that I need to get in the week and I'm going to get all the exercise that I want to get. I'm going to have to Mm -hmm. shop and cook still. So it actually allows me to um, really enjoy the time that I am indulging in myself Mm -hmm. rather than just feeling guilty for indulging in myself. Totally. It's it's like being intentional and mindful, right? Like intentional and mindful about how you spend your time. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So along these lines of, you know, perfectionism, people pleasing, boundaries, do you think there's anything that we missed out on or any final words that you'd like to share with the listeners and viewers today? Yeah. So, um, I'll just share one of the exercises that I do with my clients and it's actually one of my most downloaded podcast episodes as well, but it's just because sometimes it's hard to know what a boundary is and what's okay and what's not okay. And especially when we're talking in the, the dating and the relationship sphere of like what might be a red flag. Mm -hmm. Last night I had a webinar and I heard someone refer to them as yellow flags and they ignored the yellow flags until they became red flags. And I'm like, I love that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But that's just to figure out what yes and no feel like in the body and just like being really, really in tune with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the thing is, is like I said earlier, like boundaries are always guess and check, not always guess and check, but a lot of times are guess and check. We're not, We might get into a relationship and something we thought was a boundary or non-negotiable actually isn't. Right. And maybe something that we didn't think was actually is. And so it can be a little bit hard to manage that and figure Mm -hmm. out what's true for you and what's not true for you. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that it's impossible for me to tell someone what's true for them. I can help guide them. Right. uh, Figure it out for themselves. But I can't say, oh, no, you don't actually believe that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's not what I can do. And so this idea of yes, no, and well, I'll just do yes and no in in the body. Um, that's just simply taking a question of, just, let's just start with a very easy question. Like, should I stay in the relationship? Like if you're doubting the relationship that you're in, or if you're dating, met a guy and you're not really sure about it, um, just sitting on it for about 10 minutes each. Um, first, just sitting on it with um, closing your eyes, setting a timer so you're not watching your phone for about 10 minutes, maybe 15, and just mm-hmm. breathing and um, really owning this idea of, yes, you're going to stay in the relationship. And just see not only what comes up for you in terms of your thoughts, but also what that feels like in the body. Like, Mm -hmm. do you feel expansive or do you feel more closed and you feel like a pit in your stomach or you feel your chest clenching, Um, maybe your throat Mm -hmm. clenches, your jaw clenches. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you're going to do the same thing again and um, set the timer for 10 minutes and just imagine what not staying in the relationship feels Mm -hmm. like. Do you feel, again, like expansiveness and openness and um, weight lifting up your shoulder, or do you feel like a pit in your stomach and you feel heavy and dread? Mm-hmm. Um, that will kind of tell you what is, you know, mm-hmm. what your uh, course of action um, uh, should be. And um, that's, I mean, that's your intuition talking to you. That's, and it's something that I can't tell you what it feels like for you. You just kind of have to figure out what yes and no feels like in your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you do this, sometimes I, I find at least it becomes a little bit easier. Like I'm pretty intuitive. I can pick up 
um, red flags from, and this is actually why I originally started this business because my friends would always ask me about like, what do they think? What do I think about this? What do I think about this? Because I'm, I don't know, I must have a sixth sense when it comes to this, but you know, when something seems off or like when there's a potential red flag, so we call mm-hmm. it a yellow flag, like, <laughs> it just gets, you just get, um, it gets easier with time. And so I kind of use the question of more of like, should you stay in the relationship? Should you not stay in the relationship? But in terms of like a boundary, um, you know, it could just be like, um, you know, is not moving in together before getting married. Like how does, you know, that's a huge question. Yeah. For a lot of people, and it's definitely some people like absolutely want to live with their partner before they get married. And some people absolutely don't. And so if you're dating someone who's not on the same page as you, well, you can still sit on it because you might actually think, Oh wow, maybe it's actually not as important to me as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Or you might be like, yeah, no, this is a non-negotiable. Like I got to get out of here. Right. Um, so whatever other boundary you're hitting up against in a relationship and you're not really sure what to do, I mean, you can ask my advice. You could like, really, well, I don't know if you could ask, or you could probably ask my advice <laughs> in my Facebook group, but you can ask your friend's advice. You can ask your mom's advice. You can ask everyone's advice, but you're really just looking, um, you're just really looking for permission to do what you already want to do and to figure out what you want to mm-hmm. really do is just to do this little um, mm-hmm. meditation. I love that idea of starting to trust your body's wisdom, which we, uh, we get so far away from in our kind of, logical society I suppose and you know I think gosh I know for myself even though I'm a very intuitive person and even though I'm very familiar with yoga and meditation and learning how to trust my body because I do think it takes a lot of time to not only feel what yes and no feel like but then to also trust it enough to act on it because there's there's not enough of a language center right to to be able to help it make logical sense and you know I think at least in my experience in those sorts of circumstances I would have the feeling and I think I would know what yes and no feel I would know what that feels like and know how to differentiate but then not trust it and so I'd go back to this like pros and cons list and then it's like oh well the pros are way longer than the cons so I should stay in the relationship but my gut tells me no you know like it can be really hard but I think it is worth learning how to you trust can make that. You yourself think anything you want to think. That's yeah, I know. Person, yeah, I don't think, I forgot about pros and cons lists. Actually. Yeah. It's really funny. Um, I, I, I think I've definitely written them before. And I know I wrote one before I moved to Dallas when we yep. were living in D.C. I wrote a pros and cons list for Dallas, actually. That's kind of funny to think about. I totally forgot that I did that. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, yeah, so you can make yourself think anything you want to think. Yeah. Because... Um, what the brain does is that it collects evidence to support whatever that you're thinking. So, um, and this was actually something that I had to do for myself for a couple of times, but, um, just an example, like when we first moved to Dallas, I was like, Oh, made the wrong decision. I really hate Dallas. And so I just kept looking for, um, evidence to support my belief that I hated Dallas. Um, and then when I started shifting my awareness to evidence to support that, like, Dallas actually has a lot going for it. It's actually a really fun city. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I actually, I started enjoying Dallas. And mm-hmm. I actually like it here now. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's the same thing. Like if you're looking to stay in a relationship or get out of a relationship or whatever else is just bumping up, you're bumping up against in dating relationships, you're going to be able to take your way to either side. So just know that like, and that's where the mental circles are going. Mm-hmm. You can easily be a yes one day and then easily just be a no the complete next day. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're, and it's just never going to stop and it's going to feel endless. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you're able to listen into your intuition, your intuition is going to be spot on. And, Mm -hmm. and like, yeah, you're right. It is just a matter of actually trusting intuition and then acting off of it, which is a whole other. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And you know, I love that you brought that, brought that up because it applies not only to dating and not only to, you know, is this food good for me or not good for me? Or like, how is it going to serve me? But like everything, you know, intuition can be the answer to any question. And sometimes it takes longer to get an answer, but you know, learning how to tap into that body wisdom is, is an awesome skill to practice. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, I love that you added that. Um, So again, yeah, thanks so much, Veronica, for jumping in for part two of this conversation. And just remind the people who are listening or viewing, um, just remind them where you can be found in the interwebs. Yeah, Mm. the interwebs. So my corner of the interweb is at (laughs) veronicagrant.com. And I'm all about dating yourself. And you can get 37 ways to date yourself if you're not sure how to date yourself um, from veronicagrant.com. And then, of course, my... um, 
uh, my baby is my podcast, Date Yourself Radio. I'm on iTunes, Stitcher, and soon Spotify. The Palm Church community on Spotify. Yet. Awesome. <laughs> That's going to be fabulous. Cool. Well, thanks so much for blocking out the time, and uh, we'll chat. Yeah, totally. Chat with you very soon. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Sure.